welcome. Uh, my name is Dot Porter. I am the curator in the Special Collections Department, uh, the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books and Manuscripts at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. And um, this is Coffee with a Codex. Uh, so once a week on Wednesdays at noon, I go to the shelves and pull out a manuscript and we talk about it for about 30 minutes. Uh, it's pretty informal and uh, it's an interesting opportunity to see some different kinds of books. Today, I am really pleased to be joined by um, Louis Meiselman, who is the uh, cataloger in the Katz Center, which is our um, library and special collections for uh, Judaica and Judaic studies. And so I asked, I asked Louis, I said, do you have a neat manuscript and we can talk about it? And he said, oh, I just cataloged this thing and it's so cool. And I agree, it's very cool. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna show this to you. Um, it is, as you can see here, um, manuscript number 533 from the CAT Center. Uh, we don't usually show you the boxes. So this is a, this is a little uh, opportunity. Um, a lot of our manuscripts are um, in boxes, particularly when they're fragile. Um, in different ways. And this one, you're gonna understand in just a second why I'm showing you the box. So here we go, we're gonna open this up. It's just a nice, just a regular old box. Nothing, nothing interesting about the box, nothing to see here, except that when you open the box, what is this? What's going on? Okay, so this book, this book is really little. Uh, and there are actually, there are two things in here. Let's take a look at the book the book first. So um, here it is. It's a little prayer book um, written in the 18th century. And so I'm going to take this out. I'm also, while I'm here, I will take this out as well. It is, it's put in this box with its original slip case. And so when the, when this manuscript was written, it would have been put in this, oh, how do I open it? Here we go would have been actually put inside this slip case. Um, but we're not going to put it in there anymore because it would, it's just not good for it now. But we wanna keep it as sort of a record of that. So here's the slip case. Maybe we can take a, a look at that a little bit later. But here's this little book. And um, let's see, it is very small and very pretty. The record, um, so it was written in Amsterdam in 1765. So the date 1765, 1766, um, Lewis, does that mean it was either written in those days or that it was, it was written over the course of those two years? It could have been either one of those years because it only has a Hebrew date and the Hebrew year begins kind of like at the end of August or September. Right. And then it goes on to the following August, September. So it could cover uh, one of two. When it when it says 5426, it could cover either 1765 or 1766. Okay. Okay. That's that's good to know. I think that is that is good to know. So here we have the sort of title page here. And I was asking earlier, we know who the scribe is. Um, and the scribe is pretty notable. And we can talk, we can talk more about the scribe in a minute. Um, but I asked you how we know who the who the scribe is. And it's because he wrote his name in here somewhere, but not on the title page, right? Right. Uh, I'm going to refer to the record and tell you where that would be. Okay, I have my Zoom. I should have my I have should have the record open too next to my Zoom. I just haven't done that. Oop. All right. But the title, so we have the title from the opening leaf, uh, which is actually here. So there's the title page. And the, the text is, um, 
it's a prayer. I, I looked into the blessing of Omer and it has to do with a uh, feast around grain, the grain harvest. Is that right? Yeah. Um, originally. Yeah, that come, that's, that is the biblical day counts uh, that follow pa the first day of Passover, 49 days. And on the 50th day is the holiday of Pentecost or Shavuot. And um, that continues, even though we don't have the, you know, it's not really followed as an agricultural feast any longer, but mm -hmm. the, the, that sort of idea of counting uh, is still a liturgical, um, a, a, a liturgical uh, ceremony, if you want to use that word. Oh, but yes, that, that makes sense. And so is each, is each of these lines one of the, one of the counts? Yeah, that's right. Each word of which begins a new line said means today. And that means today is the day of this. And it's this number of days and weeks have passed since the beginning of this counting of the Omer. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th it, it appears that this manuscript was uh, brought along um, as a travel manuscript. It was brought along with somebody as they as they went, and that's why maybe it has to do with the size. And um, it was it, it was something that they did at every evening to, to make sure to count the Omer and uh, to get the day count and the weekly count correct, uh, which is part of might may have been part of the impetus of of the writing of this manuscript. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask about the size of it because it is so it's so little it seems like it would be something that you would carry with you um either on a trip or even just to sort of have it in your pocket um when it was time to to do that um so there's the counting and then here is something there is something else happening here um yeah, that's a that's like a, a small line that's repeated after each night and each counting. Uh, that is sort of that that is sort of a prayer, asking that the original ceremony be reinstated, um, and the original ceremony being the the ceremony of the grain um, linked to the new harvest. Cool, and. This is, I'm what, let's see. There are these, I'm looking at this in particular, but I think I'm seeing them on other, like there's something is, do you know what, what that is? These little words that are just sort of down at the bottom of the page. Yeah, uh, that is a catch word. Uh, going ah, okay. The, that, that is yeah. to move to the next a folio and mm -hmm. those are the psalms which are to accompany or really to, to come after the counting um and a lot of the a lot of the the usage and repetition of these psalms is is part of the kabbalistic additions to the counting of the omer um at the right which is the verso um mm -hmm. you'll see psalm 67 which is at the top and then the second paragraph is a, a kabbalistic sort of benediction to come after it and uh, uh i would say it's possible that these these sort of additions to this to the counting of the omer make it not just a, a day and a week mention but it's also um something something that's more momentous i guess mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this would, so the, the prayer would have been added at some, I mean, it's, <laughs> I say at some later point, but what later point am I talking about? I mean, Jewish history is, is pretty vast, actually. So would this have been pretty recent to the time it was written or? Absolutely. Um, okay. I think that one comes from the 17th century. And okay. uh, I'll, a good number of those sorts of things came into the liturgy in the 17th century. I think what's remarkable 
as far as this manuscript is concerned with that edition of that prayer is that um, we know that our scribe, because uh, we, we know him through other sources, is a, a Sephardic scribe. And he descends from the Sephardic Jews of Spain uh, in the Spanish and Portuguese community of Amsterdam. Yet that prayer is an Ashkenazic prayer and mm -hmm. that was in a different liturgy. And I dug around a little bit when I was cataloging this and I saw that all of the other manuscripts he wrote are Sephardic. And this is the only one to, at least that we I've seen that has survived that is Ashkenazic. Um, and that I thought, thought that was that was remarkable too, that um, the only manuscript commissioned by an Ashkenazic patron is is this one by the by the scribe. Mm -hmm. So he as a scribe, he he was then like a like a professional scribe. And as you say, he would have been being commissioned to uh, to write to write these um, instead of. So this isn't him saying now I'm going to no, I've decided I'm going to write an Ashkenazic manuscript. This is him being paid to. To, to do that by the person who commissioned him. That's right. He's writing a different liturgy uh, for a commission for, mo for money. For commission. That's, that's really cool. Couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one is that uh, Carol Martin asks, it looked like there were a few pages preceding the title page with more random looking text. Can you tell us um, anything about those preliminary pages? Um, all that is, is one owner who signs in Hebrew and what appears to be German, um, but it isn't really German, it's just initials. And um, in Hebrew, his name is Ephraim Ben, ben Fischel, uh, Fischel is his father, and he gives us a year, uh, 1837 to 8, so it's 5598. And I thought I could make out an possibly EML through the different, I guess, decorative scribbles. Um, the I, different paleographers might read something else there. Um, at least I have his Hebrew name. So this is so this is a owner's owner's signature, and then we can add this to the to the. Um, yeah, he's in the record in the I'm blanking on the on the word that I'm looking for the um, the provenance fields. provenance. Thank you. I know that word. I just wasn't thinking of it. So is this this was quite a bit later from when he writ, wrote it. So this was probably not this was not the person who commissioned it. This was somebody who owned it after. Right. Um, it I think it's probably important to mention that often with liturgical and sacred manuscripts. So people will have a name that they actually use and then they'll have their Hebrew name. And this is a case where the person who commissioned the manuscript and this owner didn't write the name he actually used, he wrote his Hebrew name, um, which would be the name he would use in, a, in the synagogue and he'd be called up, he'd be called up to the Torah, which is another ceremony. And they would use his Hebrew name, they would call him by his Hebrew name and his father's Hebrew name. Um, so that actually, to, to me, that poses a challenge because I would like to know actually who he is. And mm. it's impossible, close to impossible to know who somebody is just based on their uh, Hebrew name alone. Yeah, because that wasn't something that would have been, that was a personal name that wasn't, wouldn't have been in like official documents with the, with the government that you would normally have. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, especially in, in Western Europe, um, people had vernacular names and they also had um, surnames at this point. And um, it, if somebody, especially somebody who would have, you know, who we would have heard of like in, in, a, in an important place like Amsterdam, if we would have known what his name was, we would probably have been able to trace him through other documents and different items that have survived. But uh, because he is using his Hebrew name, uh, I don't think we can decisively know until maybe maybe until another manuscript is discovered 
that lists his regular name and his Hebrew name, and he has the same handwriting, and then we could pr present a theory. But until then, I, I don't really know who he is. Mm -hmm. And the other question in the chat is from Jim Stokes, who is asking about the prayer for the return to the original ceremony mm -hmm. um, and asking whether that represents um, religious resistance to changes that have taken place. I don't think that that's really what it represents because um, that is a that is a pretty commonly mentioned prayer, and I think it I think it is simply because um, in you know the biblical Israel in the land of Israel uh, would have observed this ritual as part of uh, using the grain and the new harvest as opposed to the past year's harvest. And that, you know, in, after the destruction of the temple, none of that really survived. And it obviously wouldn't make sense in early modern uh, Western Europe. So um, that is part of what is instituted in prayer just to recall the earlier days, uh, which is an important part of almost all the prayers uh, in, in Judaism, even across the different rites, is that it's trying to recall the ancient days, the temple days, you know, those old times when things were closer to what is described in the Bible um, than in, in modern life. Can we, can we talk about this opening for a second? This is the first time I've, I've really looked at this and it looks like there are several different scripts happening on this page and, um, I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about what what we're seeing here with the larger and the smaller scripts. I could tell you about that specific prayer, but I think it bears mentioning about this scribe that he had he had a really, I would say, unique and very professional script that he developed, which is a hybrid of ritual script and square script that had been that had been used actually uh, practically. And I've, I dug around at the different manuscripts available from him. Um, virtually every one of them is in Amsterdam besides this and one other small item in New York. And um, his, he sort of managed a pretty nice hybrid of ritual script, which you would find in a Torah or you'd find in ritual items. And then you would find a square script in all kinds of manuscript codices and even similar to some printed items at this time. Um, th the page that Dot has opened the folio is from the blessing of the new moon. And um, that is a monthly blessing that uh, often, often people would recite that blessing when they, when they first glimpsed the new moon. And that's another reason why it's important to have this prayer in a small manuscript, which you can carry in your pocket. Um, and it's Dot has a really interesting folio open. Um, on that very page is an old custom um, to after you recite the blessing over the new moon, you greet your friend and you say peace unto you. And then he responds and peace unto you as well. And so if you look closer down to the bottom of the of the verso which is on my right um you could say one should say to their friend and it's in the light of the new moon um peace of peace unto you and then his friend responds and that's in the smaller uh, the smaller script and peace unto you too and that is a that is a very old custom uh which follows the blessing of the new moon um that one should greet their friend uh, one should greet their friend in happiness, you know, af after seeing the new moon, basically meaning living another month. I like that. I like that a lot. And I like, and I like that it's written. I like how it's written in this manuscript that you can, you can, I could tell from looking at it that there was something, you know, that there was something happening there. Um, so let's see. I'm curious I just, I just about 
oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Um, uh, it looked like there was an ownership stamp um, at the beginning, which would be an even more recent owner, I imagine. And I wonder if that's somebody, Lewis, that you've in, like, is that somebody that you were able to find as an owner of other other books or manuscripts? Sure. Um, to make a long story short, um, the, he's in a very important Judaica collector um, who had a very large sale in 2019 in Sotheby's. Um, his name, Arthur Marx, and that stamp is in Hebrew. That's his Hebrew name, Avraham Marx. Um, and he, it was, a, it was a very large sale of different Judaica items. We, we at Penn bought two manuscripts from that sale with this being the first. And, um, that this sale was important enough that it's called, uh, called under his name. If you have some extra time, you can look up at Sotheby's website <laughs> and see some of the magnificent items that, uh, were in that in that sale. Uh, I was lucky enough to actually be there on the night before the auction and to handle some of the items. And I, you'll just have to trust me, but they are even more, a lot of these books and manuscripts were even more magnificent um, in person than they are in the photos. Not only that, but there was silver, uh, there was art, there was other things that were just really nice. It was uh, quite an, an important sale. Um, in the record, I have his Hebrew and his English name. So, let's see. We, um, because the, the scribe was so important, sorry, I've got a cough coming. <coughs> um, I was able to find a digital, sort of an online image of the from the manuscript that you mentioned in the um, in the record, and we have a few minutes if you want. I can share my screen, and we can we can look at that and sort of compare it with um, with this one because it looks really it looks different. <laughs> it's a different kind of manuscript. So um, so I'm going to say goodbye to this for just a moment, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, oop, and then we'll take a quick look at uh, that, there we go. So this is the, this is the only um, image that I could find of this particular manuscript. Uh, and this is, um, I don't know what, I don't remember what the, what type of manuscript it's from, but clearly it's more highly decorated, um, and it, but it's still got this beautiful sort of clear script, uh, the writing, uh, writing script. Would he have, um, I guess I have two questions. One, what is, uh, what is this document? And then the second question I have is, would he have done the artwork himself or did, was there someone else who would, who would, who would do the, the border art? Um, to my knowledge, he did everything. Um, oh, wow. And he's, according to what I've been able to dig up, he's considered to be an artist as well as a scribe. And, um, you know, his, this is an example, I believe, of one of the designs he, he created uh, that is in Amsterdam today. Um, according to what I've seen, the only items from, from the scribe, Yakutil Sulfur, is um, our manuscript and one small item at JTS in New York. And this is one of the things he was more famous for, which was the, the design of the Ten Commandments. What, what you're looking at is the, the Ten Commandments here and in between is floral designs and a, and a crown. Um, and according, according to the website that we're looking at, this design was to be copied and put onto the large curtain that stands at the front of a synagogue. And it would be the first thing that catches your eye as you come into the synagogue and you'll see this actual design embroidered onto the curtain that closes over the ark, which carries the Torah scrolls. Um, and as you can see here in this photo or in this scan, 
um, this, the script is the same as our manuscript, uh, even though this is a little bit later. Um, and um, it is the, I guess you would say it's the hallmark script of, of this scribe um, that other people have maybe tried to get to approximate that script, but I've never seen, I've never seen it as professional and consistent as I have seen from the scribe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really, I'm looking at it and I'm really impressed with how, I mean, this could be, they're identical, you know, these, these words here that are all the same words, that's just really nicely done. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm used to seeing kind of messy, like Latin, you like, I wouldn't, I can't imagine seeing this in, in a Latin, uh, even in a really nice Latin manuscript, that's just really, really nicely done. Um, so I'm going to stop. And we'll come back and take one last look. I just before we go, I do want to take a quick look at the, even though it's pretty ugly, <laughs> it's kind of coming apart, but but we have this little slipcase. And so I can imagine someone, you know, walking around, you just slip it in your pocket, put it in the slipcase, slip it in your pocket. And when you see the new moon, you know where to go. When you when you need to count the days, you know, you know where to go. So that is that is it any any last final thoughts on that lewis or any any last questions before we um i would i would be interested to hear from my colleagues as to how often we see especially pre 1800 such small manuscripts surviving um and maybe something about the slipcases surviving as well um because when things are smaller, they tend to disappear, uh, as we all know. Yeah, well, I, I tend to work with manuscripts that are earlier, um, even than this. This is the smallest manuscript I've seen. I've seen printed books um, that, are, that are sort of this size or even smaller, but they tend to be marketed as like, as tiny books like they're made because they're tiny and this is more like it just happens to be the size because that's convenient for the person using it and i so i think that's a different kind of genre um i don't know amy have you ever seen anything this we have script this a small? couple of um tiny qurans which for which um our conservation department has made a similar uh, kind of housing. You you take mm -hmm. a box off the shelf thinking you're getting a book the normal size and you open it up and it's one of these sort of Russian doll um, scenarios. So um, I think uh, though those can can rival this for um, being short, they are quite a lot thicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is both small and thin. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, little so full full Qurans or or just partial? Um, full, full. Wow. Yeah, that would be thick. Um, cool. Well, this was great. Thank you so much, Lewis, um, for for walking us through this. This is a really a real joy to to share. So thanks everybody for coming, and hope to see you uh, again soon. So take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.